Good afternoon, bon après-midi. Welcome to this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. I'm coming to you live from the brutalist majesty of the Rutherford Physics Building at McGill University in beautiful downtown Montreal, where I'm sporting a fashionable Martlet mask, both because it's required in the Rutherford Building, but also because it protects myself and my fellow physicists. If you are in the Zoom session and you prepare, uh, prefer not to be recorded or live streamed, please log out of Zoom and join us via YouTube. This afternoon, we will have a 45 minute talk followed by 15 minutes of questions and answers. To ask a question in Zoom, please use the raise hand feature following the talk. To ask a question in YouTube, please enter it into the chat. The questions will be relayed to me by my sidekick following the talk. After the Q&A session, the live stream and recording will stop. Professors will be asked to log out of the Zoom session and undergrads, grads and postdocs, as well as other non-faculty in the Zoom session will be invited to the après colloque, a chance to get to know the speaker in a more intimate setting. With that, I will now pass to Professor Ken Reagan to introduce the speaker, Ken. Thank you, uh, Bill, masked man. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Elisa Rosconi today. Uh, Elisa joins us from TU Munich, uh, where she is an expert in astroparticle physics and, and specifically neutrino studies. Uh, Elisa did her uh, graduate work in Milano and, and Genova, and uh, the, uh, her research uh, dissertation was um, based on a solar neutrino study at Grand Sa the Gran Sasso lab in, in uh, central uh, Italy and her PhD uh, dates from 2002. And then she moved to uh, Daisy Zoyten with a Marie Curie fellowship, and then on in 2005 to MPI uh, Heidelberg, where she had an Emmy Noether uh, research group. And since 2012, she's been at TU Munich, uh, where she is now Liesel Beckman. Uh, uh, she has a Liesel Beckman professorship. So she's going to talk to us about uh, neutrino uh, astrophysics and ice cube and with the Canadian connection, uh, through the P1 experiment, which I hope she will uh, talk about at the end of her talk. So welcome, Elisa. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much, Ken, for this introduction and this invitation. And yes, I just jump directly in and I want to tell you about the universe. I want to tell you about neutrinos and how eventually a new astronomy is in this year uh, getting started. But before arriving to the new, I want to cover very briefly through a, a, a video, which is fully based on data, uh, by the way, uh, about the known uh, universe. And uh, so this is now a little bit of, uh, of a jump. So we are not allowed in these days to move very far, but indeed, uh, at least virtually, we can go very far away. And today, I bring you at the beginning of the universe. And for a second, actually, we go outside the universe, which is, of course, as you know, not physical. Okay, this is our planet Earth, a very fragile system, beautiful system. These are all the uh, satellites that we have been able to put. Uh, that is why also we are able to communicate, at least partially, uh, this evening. A lot of debris outside there. And well, now we are going to see the sun, our solar system. Uh, sun is a source of low energy neutrinos. I'm not going to cover uh, that. You see all the planets, uh, all of you have studied Kepler laws uh, and, uh, and all of this. And now we are going to fly into our Milky Way, the galaxy. Until 30, 40 years ago, actually, most of the people were uh, convinced that the entire universe uh, basically contain our galaxy. So the concept, the concept about uh, multi-galaxy and uh, beyond our galaxy is relatively recent, thanks mainly to Hubble Space Telescope that has produced a huge amount of images, which have changed actually our understanding of the universe. So here actually we are nearly at the beginning. So going far, we also go back in the history. We see for a second the microwave background the coldest uh, uh, radiation. As I said, we are out from the universe in a second, but now we are flying back. And as I repeat, uh, all of this is, has been explored uh, through many satellites experiments, many ground-based experiments. And now don't worry, we find back uh, our way to our Milky Way, the center, there's a supermassive black hole, Nobel Prize from uh, this year, also from a colleague here on campus. So we were all very excited. And we are back now to our Earth. Okay, so now uh, everything I want, I, I sort of cover in uh, this video is actually full on the webpage of the museum. It's more than six minutes. 
I just condense uh, uh, in the most, uh, let's say, exciting part. And the point I want to make here is that everything we have been seeing is uh, uh, due to the fact that we explore the universe in photons, electromagnetic uh, radiation. And uh, what human beings have been able to do over the last uh, yeah, couple of hundreds years, but with a big improvement over the last 50 years, is to instrument uh, our capability to explore the universe in gravitation in, in, uh, in, uh, in photons all over the electromagnetic way. So really we have instrumentation from radio that you see on your right hand side, down to the gamma rays, so TeV electron volt uh, photons. We cover in space every time the, the atmosphere shield us from uh, uh, this uh, wave band and we cover our exploration of the universe uh, on the ground every time the atmosphere is uh, transparent, like for example, in the optical. And so um, every time I show these first two slides, a lot of people, mainly non-physicists, uh, but a lot of people get the feeling that our job is done. Uh, you know, basically we have been able to map our history, our universe down to the beginning. So what's the deal to continue uh, all of that? And so I have to disappoint a little bit the audience at this stage. I'm very sorry, but somehow then I tell you also how we are trying to compensate from the fact that actually everything I have been showing you, so the standard meta that permeates the universe uh, is about only 5% of the entire uh, energy mass budget that uh, thanks to mission like Planck, we are able right now to, to do. So we are able to a certain extent to weight uh, the universe and we are able even to distinguish the main components. So ordinary matter is about 4.9%. And then we know that there are two components that we call them dark uh, because we actually don't have a lot of clue uh, about what they are. And one is really something we believe is matter. And so we call it dark matter, it's about 26.8%. And then we have uh, uh, dark energy, which is, if you want, I like to call it an anti-gravity. So something like gravity, but uh, that works uh, the other way around. So push uh, into acceleration, uh, uh, the universe the universe is not only expanding, but it's, uh, the, the expansion is accelerating. Okay. so. Uh, this all call from <clears throat> something uh, that goes beyond electromagnetic uh, radiation and photon astronomy. Okay? So that's the reason why uh, a very large community is trying to explore uh, what is out there in many other ways. Uh, neutrinos is one. You have for sure seen gravitational waves uh, coming up uh, uh, fantastically through incredible measurements, but also cosmic rays. And so we try to compensate from uh, this, uh, this, uh, this unknown and the part of the universe that remain obscure, remain dark, using other uh, messengers, as we call. Now I jump from the ultra big to the ultra small. And uh, because the question is, yes, why are we using only photons for doing astronomy? And so this is also probably something that every student here has seen uh, probably in some classes, these are the building blocks of uh, our meta as uh, we know it uh, by now. The photon is here, um, okay. And then we have the quarks uh, and we have the leptons. Um, and so uh, the photon has a great advantage that is neutral. And so it's going through the universe very nicely. It's not affected by intervening magnetic fields, has no mass. So that's the reason why, in a sense, is really the ideal messenger for the universe. And so that's the reason why it's so successful astronomy using photons. But we have a similar uh, way or similar messengers. So if we want to glow as close as possible to photons, we might want to use neutrinos. It also neutral. Uh, they interact even uh, less, okay? They do not interact uh, weak, uh, electromagnetically, but neutrinos interact only weakly. So the probability of the interaction is so low that uh, from the moment they are produced somewhere, uh, and I come back to where these possible places uh, could be of production, neutrinos will stream undisturbed, even less disturbed by anything than actually uh, photons. That's the reason why neutrinos are actually a fantastic alternative uh, to photons. Apart, of course, that you pay a price every time you want them to detect them, 
enterprise, as I said, they do not interact this guy or they interact very, very rarely. And so once you want to do neutrino astronomy, so astronomy not with photons this time, but with neutrinos, you need from day one to instrument huge uh, volume, okay? This idea of using neutrinos uh, to explore the universe, surprisingly enough, came before, before we knew anything, before we knew uh, that there was an entire massive amount of galaxies beyond our galaxies anticipate to you, the, the perception of our universe changed enormously after the Hubble Space Telescope in particular. And even uh, once we knew very little about particle physics, so these were the 60s. And in the 60s, apart many other things uh, in, in, in our modern culture, uh, three papers appeared that are listed here, which are the seminal papers for the entire field of neutrino exploration of the universe. So Greisen, Reines, and Markov independently sort of uh, put forward not only the idea. So the idea is summarized in this sentence from Reines, which uh, he was saying, well, neutrino uh, interact uh, weekly. So they propagate essentially unchanged interaction and energy from their point of, uh, of origin. And so carry information, which may be unique in character. Okay, that is the essence of uh, exploring the universe in neutrinos. So we really uh, think that neutrinos carry information, that's the reason why we call them messengers, that are unique because photons uh, will not be able to escape from some astronomical environment. Um, and so they would not be able to bring us some of this information. Even more strikingly uh, than this vision uh, from, uh, from Reines was uh, the idea of how to do neutral astronomy. And Grimes uh, identify um, underground places like mine um, to be instrumented with large volume of uh, water. And well, I don't have to tell the Canadian audience uh, that uh, Snow Lab actually uh, <laughs> realized uh, in, in all glory uh, this, this, uh, this vision with the uh, snow experiment. But Markov put forward also the idea to use beyond uh, mine and experiments in underground, deep ocean. Uh, and this was already sort of breaking out what the field eventually uh, became, uh, meaning lower energetic neutrinos in underground experiment. I mentioned Snow Lab, but of course it's the Sasso Laboratory. There is the Kamioka mine and a few other places in the world with small, smaller uh, laboratory and at higher energy actually instrumentation in the ocean. And as I'm going to tell you also at the South Pole, because at high energy you need even larger volumes. So you don't fit into any underground places once you talk about cubic kilometer scale uh, projects. And so this is where we are coming from, right? Fascination about experimenting and, and investigating the universe. This fascination is, uh, uh, yeah, 80, no, 60 years after uh, still fully valid. We have made a lot and we have realized uh, this uh, vision uh, today. So now I jump from this, let's say quite a uh, broad introduction into a very recent uh, paper that uh, uh, from these three colleagues uh, that in, 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 in this uh, uh, review paper, which I recommend for anyone that is interested in neutrinos, um, they, they summarized uh, the picture of the broadband picture of neutrinos. As I told you in photons, right, we have been able to instrument uh, the entire electromagnetic spectrum from radio to TV. Well, you might ask, uh, is it actually going to be relevant to instrument the many energy bands in neutrinos too? And my answer will, say, will be yes, because <clears throat> from extremely low energy, micro <clears throat> uh, electron uh, volt up to extremely high energy, <clears throat> we predict, we expect actually the universe will be permeated by neutrinos. Neutrinos coming from or left over from the Big Bang, like the cosmic neutrino background, um, the neutrinos coming from the sun, neutrinos coming also from Earth, like the geoneutrinos, uh, reactor neutrinos, 
Neutrinos coming from the atmosphere and neutrinos coming uh, beyond our atmosphere from uh, very highly energetic events in our uh, universe. Sometimes this compilation, I do not go into details. If I teach about uh, neutrinos, usually that is one of my first uh, lectures. I take one entire lecture of two hours to go through all uh, these components. So today I summarize that. Usually we talk about the GUNS, so the Grand Unified Neutrino Spectrum, if you want, is, uh, is an idea of the first uh, of this type of, of, uh, of uh, compilation. But for you, it's simply to know that the universe is a rich source of uh, neutrinos in many uh, wavelengths, but we haven't been able uh, to, to explore all of them. Actually, we are pretty limited uh, right now, despite the success of many missions. So this white area is the one that we have been able to uh, see uh, with experiments. And this even smaller window is the window that I'm going to cover uh, in the next. It is actually the window that uh, neutrino telescope deployed in natural media, ice or water are able to cover. So mainly atmospheric neutrinos, uh, so cosmic ray interacting in our atmosphere uh, producing a lot of particles. As you probably know, particle physics has been born in the atmosphere from balloon experiments. So we see the products of pions and cairns decaying, producing leptons, and among these leptons also neutrinos. Uh, neutrinos in the atmosphere have been used uh, to study neutrino properties through oscillation experiments. So this is not only background, but fantastic uh, set and laboratory that uh, nature has given us to do particle physics. And then at higher energy is where I think the excitement of the last year is coming because we are starting to see astrophysical sources and astrophysical objects uh, producing neutrinos. And this is all related to particle acceleration, boosting particles in astrophysical objects at very, very high energy. I come back uh, to all of this. Last point also very important are cross-sections. I told you uh, neutrinos have the plus uh, that they interact only weekly. So from the messenger point of view, from the information uh, transportation point of view are excellent. Okay, they are producing some interaction. You can start to think about proton accelerated at uh, hundreds of TV and interacting with ambient photons and producing neutrinos. Well, these are particle physics interests. So for us, astrophysics is actually a particle physics uh, laboratory. Uh, we are not like other astronomers that they make nothing interacting, uh, only fluid to a certain extent. For us, neutrino astronomers, actually we talk about high energy particle acceleration and interaction. And then from the, this uh, interaction happening at millions of uh, light years away, these neutrinos will just go straight through. To detect them, you need that nature is kind to you and give you a decent cross-section. And so this is, uh, is uh, my own uh, hand overlay of uh, cross-section taken from this reference. So if you want the, 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 the full correct uh, version of cross-section, go here. Anyway, this is pretty correct here. We're talking about 10 to the minus 31 milli farm. All right, that's now you understand why all these components of neutrinos haven't been detected yet, because uh, it's super difficult. But look, then it's growing the cross-section uh, and we have even a resonance uh, here. So at high energy life is becoming a little bit easier once we go into studying and searching neutrinos from the universe. And that's why the focus of the field is indeed evolving at high energy because essential probability to see an interaction of neutrinos is a little bit higher. All right, so I told you in the first uh, 10, 15 minutes that uh, uh, UMBs have been amazingly successful in exploring the universe. Um, we have an idea of uh, part of the universe. We are able even to measure our ignorance. So what we know is about 5% of what is, out is outside there and so now uh, let's do the rest of job and let's go into the unknown part of the universe and how we are starting the exploration in uh, neutrinos. So this is now the South Pole. So we jump from the beginning of the universe uh, to now the geographical South Pole. This is the counting house of uh, IceCube and the detector is all down 
in uh, the ice. This guy is uh, it's called winter over. So we have always uh, every year two person staying at the south for the entire year. Uh, they stay during the full winter. It's a very long night down there. Um, and then once the sun appears at the horizon after yeah, various months of uh, complete darkness, they all get crazy and they start to send us crazy pictures. This is one of my favorite because actually it's taken from uh, one of my first doc that was spending his uh, winter at the South Pole two years ago and this year he's back. Okay, Martin Wolf, crazy, fantastic person. Anyway, he took this uh, picture of uh, the sun coming back at the end of the long winter uh, in the back of the ice cube uh, lab. So what is ice cube? Um, now in the cartoon, uh, we are, as I said, in Antarctica, pretty close at the, to the geographical South Pole. Here now you see the little house that I show you here, right? That is uh, the surface. Um, and this uh, color dot represents uh, the place where the ice cube strings, uh, as we call them, have been deployed. Uh, so you have to actually go down, you know, the, the, the Antarctica is a gigantic glacier. So you, once you land at the South Pole, you will land on top of a three kilometer thick uh, glacier. And so you have quite a lot of a massive amount of ice uh, down, down there. So the first kilometer, everything that you see here in gray, uh, these are 86 holes that we have been drilling between 2000 and 2010. Um, they are empty, uh, they contain only cable uh, for about one kilometer, a little bit more. And then we instrument with optical module, you see here one of these, these are photo tubes uh, encapsulated in the glass pressure spheres, and uh, there's a connected penetrator connect, and then basically all this, uh, the electronics is fully contained here. So they're like uh, individual computers uh, and photon detectors. Um, we have 5,160, deployed down here in a three-dimensional uh, matrix. So we instrument only the last kilometer of the glacier because here down here, the, the ice is fantastically clean. And up here, actually, we have a lot of air trapped uh, in the ice. And so it's not actually very useful to uh, have instrumentation down there. How do we detect neutrinos? Uh, uh, well, at very high energy. So usually we start to talk about detection of the neutrino ice cube at uh, hundreds of GeV, GeV 10 to the nine and above. So we have seen neutrinos up to the PV, 10 to the 15 electron volts. And uh, above hundreds of GeV neutrinos uh, to so-called deep inelastic scattering. So they see actually the quark. So they interact uh, with the matter, with the ice. Um, and and uh, after this interaction, depending on the flavor of the neutrinos, uh, secondary particles are produced. Our best channel to, to see and to point back are actually new moons, because after their interaction in the ice, uh, they produce uh, a leading muon, and the muon uh, is uh, releasing in the, in, the, in, the, in the propagation in the ice. As you know, these are highly penetrating particles uh, that produce a lot of Cherenkov light. And that's what is, uh, the phototubes detect is the Cherenkov light of the muons or even the secondary part that the muon at high energy release in the eye. So sometimes we have blobs around the tracks. So if there are particle physicists here, our muons are not as your muons in an accelerator that typically are minimal ionizing. Your muons, our muons are dominated by stochastic energy losses. If you detect electron neutrinos, as we also do, we see a more shower-like and blobbish of, of light. Uh, so I do not cover today uh, these type of events. I focus mainly on tracks. We call them tracks, this, uh, this induced uh, muon. How do they look like? Um, by now we are able to simulate, calculate everything. It was not like this when I started in year 2000, sorry, 20 years ago, my God, uh, to, to, to do so we, we have, uh, um, muons, so these are 1 PV, again, 10 to 15 electron volt horizontal muon, trays in the South Pole ice or trays in seawater. It's the same event, same muon, horizontal, as you see. Um, such a muon can travel in the ice or water 10, 15 kilometers. So uh, I did not give you, gave you the dimension of ice cube, but it's really one kilometer 
in uh, diagonal. So even one kilometer uh, neutrino telescope uh, will sample only a piece of uh, such a track. Sometimes they start and detect that these are very rare events. I like, we like them because we can reconstruct a lot of stuff. So what you see every line here or here is actually a photon, a Cherenkov photon. The color is giving you the time. So colder is shorter time after the interaction. And so in ice, what you see is that you have a lot of bluish, meaning that photons in the ice uh, stay there forever. <laughs> so the absorption uh, in the ice is extreme. Absorption length is extremely long. We talk about hundreds of meters absorption length. But the scattering is relatively short, 20, 40 meters, depending uh, where you are in the detector. So what do they do, the photons, the chunk of photons at the South Pole? They keep on streaming. So the scattering is actually a type of scatter. So the photons scatter always in the same direction. I mean, keeping the memory from where they come from. And that's the reason why these photons are, you, so you see this line are a little bit uh, scattered around. Um, which is fine in the sense we collect a lot of light, uh, we can do a lot of uh, measurements, but you can imagine reconstructing one direction might be sometimes very challenging. Uh, so we have smart algorithm uh, right now uh, to simulate. So this is all done on graphic cards, so we can really follow every photon um, and to reconstruct the incoming direction. By now we have moved uh, to neural net and uh, we have fantastic method and fantastic young students that want to do only that. <laughs> anyway, moving in water, uh, ocean, ocean water, doesn't matter if you're talking about uh, Pacific Ocean, as I'm going to tell you, or Mediterranean Sea, uh, the optical property are a little bit inverted respect to ice. So we talk about absorption of the order of 30, 40 meters. Um, but scattering is basically subdominant. And so you see the photons you are going to collect are much earlier, much a lot of direct light um, and much less scattering, which in principle is good. Uh, the information that you collect uh, in terms of Cherenkov light in water is qualitative uh, better and less affected by scattering. But of course, you need to have a lot of instrumentation to not lose uh, too much light. Yeah, so these are our friends. And once we put them inside uh, a neutrino telescope, then we start to have uh, um, the capability to see neutrinos. So this all evolved. Uh, the, the, the story of, of, of neutrino astronomy is, is very long. As you can imagine, we talk about gigantic telescopes. So originally, the idea was really to use oceans and it turned out to be super complicated and uh, not very successful. Uh, demand experiment in the Pacific Ocean, Hawaii, um, pioneered uh, the entire field. Uh, but never happened. Um, DOE at a certain time stopped financing uh, demand. Uh, and uh, sometimes happen in science, you know, you, you struggle uh, with something super complex that it does not work in the ocean. And people start to do, initiate things that seems even harder and crazier. And so for many reasons, I don't have time to go in all the anecdotes, uh, uh, people start in parallel to all the complexity of deploying phototubes in the ocean, operate them, etc., to see if they could do it um, on a stable ground, so at the South Pole uh, on the ice. And there was endless amount of fight between the team, uh, no one was going to succeed, etc., but actually, uh, contrary to any expectation or intuition, uh, the exploration of the South Pole for deploying neutrino telescope went uh, quite well. Uh, was quite a rocky uh, way until the year 2000 with the first uh, Amanda small neutrino telescope. But then, um, from the grant of IceCube, uh, the detection, the, the installation of the detector went smoother and smoother and smoother. Not that it was easy, but nevertheless, until 2010, we went on at the South Pole. Uh, instrumenting one cubic kilometer of ice and uh, having ice cube working really, really stably. Uh, we have only very few for the tubes not working. And until now, it's uh, more than 10 years that we are taking data, uh, the detector works uh, really fantastically. Okay, so um, did we manage to do something useful from science or is just a lot of fun to go to the South Pole? Uh, yes, uh, we actually 
um, managed quite a lot, I think. I'm very, very proud. And I can even tell you that at the beginning, once we completed Ice Cream 2010, uh, we were the first to be very surprised to start to see um, very high energetic events like this one that managed to arrive on the cover of science. So now basically this is uh, uh, the, how an event, uh, a neutrino event looks into the, in the detector. So every line is one string of ice cube. And here you see not anymore the, the photons. Okay, this is now, this are a simulation without the detector. Now we made the, the photons interacting the optical module and uh, from what you see here is now the signal that every uh, phototube register. Again, the color gives you a feeling of the time, warmer color, early time uh, towards uh, green. So this is now a starting event. So the vertex of interaction is here with uh, a muon type uh, going up. Okay, so these are upwards events on a neutrino crossing uh, the Earth. We started to see this gigantic these are PV 10 to 15. Uh, um, electron volt of charge released in the detector. I think this specific one is 500 TV. Um, and so this basically, um, roughly speaking, we know the atmosphere is not going to be strong enough to produce this, this, this neutrino. So we start to see a bunch. First paper was based on three of these events. At the beginning, we named all of them, you know, because you know by heart any small uh, element related to this first uh, monster neutrinos. Um, but then right now we have uh, really hundreds of them. And here I usually like to plot, to, to use this figure, which is one of the very first uh, diagram we, we plotted because uh, maintain the simplicity of these measurements. Again, energy of neutrinos and flux, the atmospheric neutrinos expected. Of course, our estimation are much more complex and sophisticated, but in any case, it's more or less like this, A minus 3.7, and you see coming a component that deviates uh, enormously from your expectation. And so by now the statistic is very high, we are about 10 sigma. So yes, ice cube discovered uh, cosmic neutrinos. So neutrinos coming beyond our atmosphere and they cannot be produced uh, uh, in anything related to atmosphere or to the sun. And so they should come from quite far away. These neutrinos are more or less isotropic in the sky. And so uh, once we, so they are not obvious the origin of the industry. It's not obvious uh, even today, but what happened uh, in 2017, September, uh, we saw a very high energetic events. We have by now a system in the South Pole that register very high energetic events and send alerts uh, to, to the rest of the, of the astronomy community and uh, well we uh, triggered on such a fantastic track this is now a track crossing ice cube 290 tv uh, very well reconstructed and from the direction uh, because i did not tell you one very important information very high energy uh, the neutrino and the muon produced by the interaction are basically perfectly aligned okay low energy does not work like this but high energy the boost is now. And so once you're able to reconstruct this kilometer long level arm, you can point back and see if there are some astronomical object. And yes, uh, ice cube triggered September 22nd, uh, 2017, uh, a large um, uh, follow up among many, many uh, telescopes around the globe. And what we observe actually was uh, the presence of uh, a so called blazer. It's an, an extragalactic uh, galaxy is an active galaxy. If you want, we can go back uh, to the details of this source. This is uh, the name. Uh, you know, astronomers like this very long name, but these are basically the coordinates and the name of the catalog of observing. And this is a bright and one of the brightest uh, objects in the sky. This is now our neutrino, and these in red are the photons, high energy photons, gamma rays. Uh, we have associated, uh, we have two science paper describing uh, this, this first association of neutrinos and uh, from the same direction, now looking uh, into all the uh, ice cube collected data over uh, various years, we could open the data cube from the same spot in the sky for where these are now all the neutrinos from ice cube on the likelihood uh, map. 
and we could look backwards in time and see also an accumulation of other uh, 10, 13 neutrinos from the same direction, supporting the case that this astrophysical object is indeed one of the very first high energy neutrino source uh, observed. This is all exciting. Uh, the level of significance is not super striking. We are talking about 3, 3.5 sigma observation. We wish to be in the regime of above 4 sigma and 5 sigma, but that is the best that with this detector we have been able to do. And so and now it comes the critical question, right? Uh, as always in science, uh, you are excited about the first uh, observation of something, but then you ask yourself, okay, can we have more? Do we have to live with one source now for, for forever? And so you sit, you with your students and colleagues and start to think what you can do to boost uh, this field. Now we know there are cosmic neutrinos, we know there are cosmic accelerators, we can detect the neutrinos, we can start to do the physics of these monster accelerators. And so how can we do it better with higher statistics and with more sources? And so the math is simple. After 10 years of exposure of one cubic kilometer neutrino task working perfectly, you have here an uptime picture is actually representative uh, of, of, of IceCube. Uh, we have been able to associate eventually one object uh, at the level three, four sigma uh, level. So how do we move now effect of 10 or even effect 100 in sensitivity in order to open and, and launch uh, this new astronomy. And so now we have to look what else is happening uh, on, the, on, the, uh, on the globe in terms of neutrino uh, telescopes. Here is what I was uh, uh, covering Ice Cube at the South Pole. It is indeed the only uh, neutrino telescope uh, at this scale able to see cosmic neutrinos in Europe and in Russia. Uh, there are two projects under construction, Cubic Kilometer Net and uh, GVD. And uh, um, we have, uh, in 2017, we means uh, uh, Carsten Krauss uh, from Alberta, Dan and Grant, he was also in Alberta now, is in the United States, and myself, just nearly randomly out of a meeting, uh, got in contact with Ocean Networks Canada. And so, um, yes, uh, the story is that uh, to boost the field and open this astronomy, we need more neutrino telescopes and we need larger neutrino telescope and we need to put all these guys together and work like a distributed uh, neutrino telescope. I skip uh, one couple of slides uh, and I come back if you want to know exactly what will be respect ice cube this network of neutrino telescope and I want to cover now what is actually happening in, in your neighborhood <laughs> uh, at, the, at the Vancouver side, Victoria side of, of Canada. So how far are we with the project uh, name Pacific Ocean Neutrino Experiment or in short uh, P1. Um, first, uh, what, why are, are we there? Yes, there is a Pacific Ocean that you understood. I like to have a lot of target material for my neutrinos. So Pacific Ocean is big enough, it's deep enough. Uh, as few other places on, on the earth. But what makes actually, so this is uh, Vancouver Island, um, and what makes uh, um, Vancouver Island that special is, is what Ocean Networks Canada has been able to build. And uh, so they basically deployed uh, in the ocean um, a, a, a loop, as you see here, of fiber optical cable. This is 800 kilometers of optical fiber cables with six nodes that you see here. And uh, the vision is really to uh, provide scientists uh, a laboratory in the ocean uh, where you can deploy any type of instrumentation. And their vision is really to provide plug and play uh, uh, possibilities. So every node is the place where you can plug in your instrumentation. So, well, again, coming up from a history which basically only at the South Pole, uh, we could do uh, the astronomy we are dreaming to, to do and seeing that something like this exists in 10 years, uh, is quite stable, has support to more than 5,000 different uh, instrumentation different. And this, by the way, is only half because there's another uh, instrumentation that is out of, of the picture is the shallow 
uh, network. Um, so while we were quite excited, and uh, uh, one place in particular got the attention, this is Cascadia Basin, is uh, one node, um, because it's very deep, 2.6 kilometers, exactly as the deepest part of, of Ice Cube. Um, it is sitting on a gigantic plateau, and this is a dark area, nothing is happening down there. The sediment is for oceanographic people, a pretty boring uh, place, but for us, uh, sounds the best place in the world, right? Is instrument, you have power, you have connection, and you can bring down your instrumentation. And so without thinking too long, with Darren and Carson, we said, well, you know, what about just uh, bringing some instrumentation down there and see how the optical properties are? Pacific Ocean hasn't been measured in, in the blue ultraviolet in terms of optical properties. So we put together with our students uh, two 140 meters long lines instrumented. Now they're not spherical glass spheres, but are uh, cylindrical for reason that is are not relevant with smaller PMTs, okay? And some calibration sources. We call it the uh, uh, straw, uh, strings for absorption lengths in water. We have a bunch of paper uh, describing exactly what, what we did, if we, you want to go in the details. And then, yes, then we, we thought, let's see how the Canadians, I mean, the Pacific Ocean and the Canadians do the, de the deployment because we physicists took care of, of the instrumentation. Then basically you, you hand over your detector to the experts. We were not allowed to be on the boat. Okay, so you really give, uh, your baby to to them, and and they leave. Uh, they they leave with the trolley boat, and they deploy. Actually, so here you see our one line of straw uh, with the two boy. Uh, the entire operation was super smooth. In a few hours, uh, our strings were down at two point six kilometers. By the way, all these uh, deployment are registered on video. If you go to the website of Ocean Networks Canada and you search for straw, you find all the video information we were able to follow from home, from here, from where am I, um, during a weekend, essentially, all the operation. These are now the arms of the remote vehicle, the ROV that is uh, diving. And then from the boat, uh, there is a crew that is operating um, and this is our anchor and the connection of our uh, two lines. Um, yeah, about five left. Sorry? Oh, about five minutes left. Ah, perfect. Yes, fantastic. We are taking data so that the two lines, uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 instrumentations, uh, 10 optical modules survive. They take data still in a very stable way and, until now. Uh, we could extract uh, some uh, preliminary information about attenuation lengths. Uh, uh, we see uh, light. Uh, there is uh, there are animals down there. 2.6 kilometer. Uh, there is still uh, life. This is called bioluminescence. It's not a discovery because other experiments saw this uh, before us. Uh, we are working with oceanographic people about that. And attenuation length is in the bulk part of what we were expecting. 35 meters at 150 uh, nanometers. Um, essentially confirming what. Also, Europeans uh, have been seen in the Mediterranean uh, Sea. This is all good news in a sense that the site looks good, but of course, we want to do more. Um, and so we build a second uh, pathfinder, as we call it, straw B, in which we, this is a little bit longer, so 500 meters uh, uh, line, it's one line this time, uh, one single cable, uh, so also the mechanics, a little bit different, larger optical mod, this is a spectrometer, so we now try to uh, style a little bit more the bioluminescence for modeling uh, that background. Uh, um, and, and, and then, yes, the idea was to deploy all of this in spring, the pandemic uh, came, uh, but nevertheless, uh, thanks to Ocean Networks Canada, we have been rescheduled uh, to October, actually September, October, then the weather was not fantastic, but in October 2020 with a reduced crew uh, on deck uh, that ONC uh, in any case uh, um, was able to, to, to operate this uh, third line uh, with 10 optical module has been also deployed, you see here now one of the module going down in the ocean. Again, everything is available online 
if you want to see these hours long uh, videos. Uh, this is now how it looks like in the counting room of Ocean Networks Canada. This is how it does it look in our counting room. This is Michael Böhm, our uh, electrical engineer that was uh, following. And the great thing is again, in the moment you deploy your online, they really, so they, Ocean Network Canada, really plug this in. And in a question of minutes from Munich, we could check and run the first check if the instrumentation survived. Uh, and this time, actually, one module out of nine, unfortunately, uh, did not survive the deployment. We are investigating this failure, probably, is one of the connector that uh, just failed. Uh, statistics is telling us that one every 50, every 80 uh, might fail. And this might be exactly what we have been seeing. Uh, this was a video, but I think I move on. Again, nice uh, part of Ocean Networks Canada, so that uh, provides you um, a slow control system, so a database uh, where all your instrumentation from the moment you switch them on. As I said, you can switch them really, really fast uh, after a few hours, uh, but uh, and so you can monitor what is uh, happening. All the data are public. It's also something Ocean Networks Canada likes to do, and I also support in a sense. So again, everything you want to check uh, in terms of what our modules are seeing and which type of information we are able to see um, is, is available. Again, good news is that uh, this is a, a, yes, work in progress, but the condition down there are excellent. Uh, the water is super transparent. The environment is very quiet. The bioluminescence we see is lower than in many other places. And so, um, so we launch uh, this. We want to have a neutral telescope down there. It's, a, it's ready, in a sense, uh, to be instrumented. Uh, and so we created Pacific Ocean Neutral Experiment, in short, P1. Um, yeah, in 2019, 2020, you see here now the node, uh, the, the Cascadia Basin node. And here is uh, the first uh, uh, design of where uh, P1 uh, might be. I uh, give you another picture. So P1 will be um, seven times uh, such a cluster of 10 strings. Again, this is all very early. So we might still change a lot of uh, details. This is now the prototype line we are designing with uh, this time optical module that uh, are instrumented in a pixelized uh, way. Can come back uh, to that. And the long term, as I said, we'll see uh, different clusters of 10 lines instrumenting a little bit more than two cubic uh, kilometers. Uh, it is, as I said, in conceptual design phase, uh, but after 20 years of ice cube, I would claim we have quite a lot of experience how this natural telescope looks like, and there is not a lot that needs to be reinvented. This is now one high energy event simulated now into uh, P1 as we envision. And uh, the, the, the way we represent uh, how a one of neutral telescope works is this energy neutrinos is what we call effective area. So how big it looks like. And as I said, this will be a little bit bigger than, than ice cubes. So a, a discovery uh, machine. Um, in the last minute, I want to give you also what we are looking at the South Pole. Uh, we are sponsoring uh, within the uh, United States and uh, Europe, uh, Ice Cube Generation 2. So now this is Ice Cube, what we have in, at the South Pole, and this is what we want to instrument uh, around. Uh, of course, uh, let's see if uh, we get the funds. The same situation is for P1, of course. We always talk about quite expensive experiments. So for P1, we are talking about 70, 80. Uh, million uh, euros uh, and uh, for high school generation to even uh, more. Um, nevertheless, um, yes, uh, uh, so I cover the history and allow me to guess the future. And so here uh, we are. Um, in ISQ, we are going to start uh, um, a new installation we call it upgrade uh, with calibration devices, etc. Uh, hopefully in a few years from now, of course, the pandemic might delay uh, for one or two years uh, now all of this, uh, but let's say optimistic. And uh, what we are now fighting for is to finance the first 10 strings of uh, P1. 
Um, we call it Explorer, so it is also called P1, but the E is not the experiment, but the Explorer. And with uh, 10 strings, uh, uh, if we'll be able to demonstrate really that uh, uh, we are able to build, deploy, operate in a stable way, 10 strings, I think the next step to operate more of this cluster will be uh, a little bit uh, easier. We might have also steps in between, like deploying prototype lines or two prototype lines, depending a little bit also about the funds that we're able to uh, mobilize. Um, ideally, then, the entire field converge, converges into an operation in which all the neutrino telescopes around the globe will work together. So I'm also involved in what we call plenum, in which all the telescopes uh, in Europe, Siberia, Canada and South Pole uh, could uh, synergize together in order to really cross calibrate each other, uh, exchange also software and hardware development and really open uh, the sky. And from our uh, preliminary studies in some parameter space, we're able, once we operate all the neutrino telescope together to boost by even to order of magnitude uh, the entire sensitivity, again, just synergizing and covering different parts of the sky. And if you have questions, I'm happy to go into more details. Okay, I think I'm running out of my time. I come to uh, some uh, conclusion, uh, as I show you at the beginning. Uh, yes, uh, exploring the universe uh, is uh, uh, complicated. We have been, uh, as a community, uh, very successful in terms of photon exploration, covering the entire electromagnetic wave and continuing on that. Uh, but we have a lot of uh, uh, mysteries in our universe that we might be able to address at least partially with the high energy neutrinos. So IceCube has been a pioneer in the field. We have been uh, opening uh, the sky in high energy neutrinos, uh, observing the so-called diffuse flux, uh, very first object has been associated uh, for the first time in 2018. It is a, a blazer. And uh, out of what we know from blazer, we might predict that the largest part of the uh, signal might be in this high energy uh, band. To really cover uh, the entire potential of what we have been able to open, we need more neutrino telescopes. We need the larger neutrino telescopes. Uh, and so we have been putting forward a complementary mission, respect IceCube in a different hemisphere uh, in water. Um, that brings, of course, uh, many advantages. Operating in the existing uh, largest oceanographic uh, infrastructure existing on Earth, uh, and this Ocean Networks Canada. So we do not have to do that. We do not have to reinvent that. We do not have to mobilize hundreds of million of Canadian dollar that have been invested uh, in Canada already. And we just need to convince a funding agency to provide us enough funds to build uh, P1 and operate this together with IceCube, IceCube Generation 2, Cubic Lantern Net, and GDP. Thank you very much for listening. And I'm looking forward to discuss more with you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for a fascinating talk about some really interesting measurements. Uh, so in lieu of applause, please, if you enjoyed the talk, write something in the Zoom chat. Or if you're watching on YouTube, please write something on YouTube. There have already been some positive comments uh, on the YouTube chat, so please keep them coming. Uh, and we already have a couple of questions lined up. Just as a reminder, if you're in the Zoom session and you would like to ask a question in person, please use the raise hand feature. That'll bring your name up to the top, and then I'll pick you up one by one. If you're interested in asking a question on YouTube, please type it into the YouTube chat. Uh, that question will be passed to me by my sidekick, uh, and I will do my best to get to as many questions as I can in the time available. So we have one question to start off that was given in the Zoom chat, if you're ready. Uh, so the question, first question is, I have a very naive question. How does one keep the line stable in the ocean for the P1? Uh, yeah. It's not at all a naive question. Uh, it's always scary when people say a naive question. <laughs> it is so. It is actually an excellent question um, because in the ocean there are currents, also in the deep ocean. Uh, by the way, Ocean Networks Canada measure these currents very well. Measure the currents at various depths, so we have this information. 
they are, um, I mean, the standard way is to, so you don't control that, you allow the, the, the currents to move your strings. So we talk about one kilometer tall strings. Uh, luckily, the currents are like a big ellipse, so they are quite predictable, they are not random, okay? Um, and, and, and what you do, you can monitor the movement. Uh, there are ways based on acoustic triangulation system. So you need a component of uh, acoustic pingers. This is how in the Mediterranean Sea people do. But I can anticipate to you that we have a new idea and uh, we are going to explore actually Canadian group from probably Matthias Danninger um, in Vancouver wants to explore a way to monitor the geometry using um, optical calibration sources. Uh, so we are trying to use actually the data stream itself to self calibrate or to align the telescope and uh, keep memory or keep the imprint of the geometry in the data uh, themselves. Uh, this might be the first thing we want really to prove in the next uh, couple of years in the ocean. Uh, so geometry, geometry calibration uh, is one of the greatest uh, deal right now. So excellent question. Uh, and, and, but we have, I think, uh, quite innovative ideas how to do it in a very straightforward way. Um, so let's, yeah, stay tuned on this. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, the next question comes from Professor Jim Klein. Jim, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I think last I heard, uh, there were not too many Glashow resonance event uh, candidates, but there was uh, one or so. Is, is that still the case or is that number changed? Yes, uh, so Glashow resonance events are uh, anti-electron neutrinos uh, that are produced uh, at very high energy PV event, uh, energies uh, because the, the, the cross section as I show you had a resonance. So it is a, a, an expected signal um, and we have by now one candidate event uh, that has been published in Nature uh, yeah, before Christmas. Um, we have only one. It is actually not even fully contained. Uh, so it's a tricky thing to identify these very large uh, events. It is in statistics um, to have after 10 years one event. Um, but yes, it would be great to have a few more. Yeah, we have only one. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's another question coming in the Zoom chat, but before I ask it, just to let everyone know, we could delay the uh, après colloque by about five minutes, so feel free to raise your hands. If you still have questions, don't feel like uh, you won't be able to get them in, so we might be able to squeeze one or two more in. So there's a question in the Zoom chat. Uh, are there any conceptual differences between rock, water, and ice type labs in the sense of direction? Um, no. I, I see here, between rock, water, ice. Uh, I do not understand why rock, but in any case, water and ice, the conceptually um, principles, how we detect neutrinos are identical. At high energy, we always talk about deep inelastic scattering. We always talk about tracks or, or shower type of events. Uh, the only thing that difference is really how photons uh, uh, Cherenkov photos propagate in the water or in the ice. So what changes is a little bit the performances of the telescopes um, and depending again uh, which energy and uh, which signature, uh, which flavor of the neutrinos. So if you, for example, want to optimize for glacial resonance events, uh, you might prefer ice. If you want to optimize for astronomy, you might prefer uh, water. Uh, but overall, we have been able to demonstrate that this telescope work both in ice and at the smaller scale also in water, thanks for the Antares Neutrino Telescope. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's another question in Zoom uh, from Catherine Savard. Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi, thank you for the great talk. Um, I was wondering whether combining neutrino detection data in real time between ice cube and P1 would improve the localization as well as the sensitivity? Yes, excellent point, Catherine. Um, of course, depends which sky uh, we will be able to cover simultaneously. So indeed, um, I have a map uh, in my backup, if I remember correctly, in which we, I, ca I can show you which part of the sky P1 and ISQ will indeed cover simultaneously. 
otherwise they would be mainly um, complementary. So for example, for the TXS 0506 by plus 056, uh, that, uh, this actually is at the horizon and P1 would also have such a source in the field of view. So this would be a dream to have two telescopes seeing simultaneously an event. Number one for statistics, guys, I, I showed these are three sigma-ish uh, thing. So to have two independent telescopes to see this means we don't have any doubt we are detecting sources. Uh, and that is a big deal first. And second, yes, you can improve everything. More events overall improve the pointing. This is a, a, every telescope works like this. So basically more photons or more neutrinos would just squeeze the pointing. And so having more telescope will be more statistic, will be better pointing. And complementarity of the systematic uncertainties will also uh, boost. So that would be uh, a coincident uh, observation would be a Nobel Prize measurement, I think. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. I don't see any other new questions unless uh, Professor Jim Klein, is your hand up because you have another question or because it was just up from before? Sorry, leftover. No problem. So uh, I think that's all the questions I see, unless there's another urgent one now, we will go to the après colloque. So everyone who is not a tenured or tenure track uh, faculty member, you're welcome to stick around in the Zoom session for uh, a further discussion with Professor Rasconi about her research or her life. Um, and so please, please stick around for that if you're in the Zoom session. Uh, and if not, I guess I will close the session. Uh, so that concludes this edition of the Physical Society Colloquium. Thanks to all who have joined us. Please join us again next week for a talk by Tzu Ching Chang uh, from the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory entitled Multi-Line Intensity Mapping with Time and Sphere X.